No. Greetings, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Mason Ritchie, uh, Associate Professor of Political Science and International Politics at Hankook University of Foreign Studies uh, here in South Korea, uh, and also a senior contributor at the Asia Society Korea. And we are pleased to have you uh, here today on our uh, special webinar on COVID-19 and the effect on democracy. I'm happy to say that we have uh, three incredible guests who have agreed to join us and take time out of their busy schedules to share their expertise with us. Uh, since we have limited time, I'll go ahead and get started with that uh, right away. I'll introduce our three guests uh, and then I will immediately start asking questions uh, and moving into the content. Uh, just to let everyone know, I sort of envision this uh, as uh, covering sort of two major topics. Uh, one is a sort of general set of questions about uh, threats to democracy uh, that arise from uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in various forms. Uh, and, and this uh, refers uh, primarily in this case to uh, the you know, social and political effects that uh, pandemics and crises have uh, on democracies. Uh, and then the second uh, issue that I would like to look at uh, is more focused on geopolitics uh, and in particular uh, how uh, the great power competition, notably between the U.S. and China, for instance, uh, is impacted uh, through the lens of democracy uh, in uh, the context of the pandemic. Um, so if, if I can go ahead and get straight to uh, introducing uh, our three guests. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Ambassador Michel Reiter, the uh, ambassador of the European Union to the Republic of Korea. Uh, he was formerly also the uh, European Union ambassador to uh, Switzerland and Liechtenstein. And uh, as a side gig, uh, he also works uh, occasionally teaching courses uh, as a professor at the University of Innsbruck. Uh, ambassador, it's always a pleasure to have you. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, second, uh, I have uh, uh, joining us today, uh, professor Sheena Greitens, uh, who is uh, currently assistant professor, if I remember correctly, at the University of Missouri, the Show Me State. But she has shown everyone uh, how tremendous a scholar she is, and she will soon be moving to uh, the University of Texas at Austin, uh, where she will be uh, associate professor of political science in the department there, uh, and also an affiliate, uh, I believe, at the Clements Center. Uh, and of course, for those of you who don't know her work, um, her uh, book on dictators and their secret police uh, won the Best Book Award uh, at the International Studies Association uh, when that book came out. So obviously quite a bit of expertise there. Uh, and then lastly, uh, but certainly uh, not least, uh, we have Professor Yasha Munk, who is an Associate Professor of the Practice of International Affairs at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, whose uh, book on the people uh, versus democracy has also been enormously well received uh, and covered uh, by numerous uh, media outlets and has been voted uh, one of the best uh, books of political science in 2018, the year that it came out, uh, among other places. Uh, this was the case at the Financial Times. Uh, he also is an affiliate uh, at uh, numerous uh, think tanks and other prestigious organizations, including, if I remember correctly, uh, being a term member at the Council of Foreign Relations. Uh, so we have uh, a huge amount of expertise and experience uh, here in the virtual room with us. So uh, that having been said, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, move uh, directly into uh, my questions. Uh, and I'm going to start one, uh, start off, I guess, with something for all of you. Uh, and that is, uh, in your estimation, how are authoritarian leaders using COVID-19 as a way to extend their own rule uh, and uh, perhaps even compete and undermine democracies abroad? Uh, I think, if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and start with uh, Professor Greitens, perhaps. Yeah, sure. Thanks. I, I think that's a really important question. And we've definitely seen across the, the globe that there are authoritarian leaders that are uh, using the pandemic to do things like pass um, strengthened measures on curfews and censorship. Um, for example, in Thailand, um, Hungary, Jordan, the Philippines have all passed emergency decrees that give the executive much more authority to rule without a lot of legislative consent or, or limitation. Um, Bolivia has postponed elections. Um, the United Kingdom is obviously debating a whole set of legislation, um, which is quite interesting in light of the, the debate over the erosion of civil liberties during the period when the UK was, was struggling with, with um, terrorism. Um, 
And so what's really interesting about this is that we do see places where autocrats are actively um, using the pandemic to generate new tools or, or pass or create new tools for themselves to strengthen non-democratic power. Um, but the other interesting dynamic that we're seeing is places like China and Vietnam where the tools that already existed for authoritarian rule are being strengthened and repurposed for public health. And so there's sort of a feedback loop between the two. Um, so China's statewide nationwide surveillance project was already underway and a huge priority under Xi Jinping. Um, and, and the pandemic has strengthened it, but it's accelerated a trend that was already, that was already in motion. Um, and so I think it's important to remember that we've seen uh, places where new challenges to democracy or further autocrati autocratization are being introduced. And then there are places where what the pandemic has done is actually to accelerate already existing trends. Um, and then maybe a third point to make is that um, an institute called, or a project called VDEM has done some work looking at the risk of democratic backsliding. Um, and they identify about 50 countries, I think it's 48 that they think are high risk, but they also identify a number, another 47 that have introduced some sort of emergency decree that they deem less risky to democratic backsliding. Um, and so I think it'd be really interesting to come back to that later and talk about what some of the you know, potential for optimism here might be and what, what models we have um, for dealing with this in a way that's very compatible with democracy. Um, but but the big big picture answer is yes, that's definitely a trend we're seeing. Great, super insights. For, for what it's worth, I did have on, on my my sort of uh, list of questions in my head uh, a few of them at least that pointed in some directions that were relatively positive, or at least would open the door to saying something positive. So I agree, it might be worth coming back and and taking a look at you know what sorts of resilience we might be able to might be able to find. Uh, uh, in uh, Republican democracies uh, and in some of the constitutional monarchies. That's an excellent point. Uh, Ambassador, if you could weigh in on this, how, how in your uh, estimation, based off of your years of experience uh, uh, in a European Union, which places extraordinary value uh, on democracy, uh, are we seeing authoritarian leaders uh, exploit uh, the current pandemic uh, for their own uh, extension of power in non-democratic ways? Well, I think I, I would like to start with a footnote. And the footnote is, it would be interesting to discuss and to analyze, which we should not do in this context, why do we already have authoritarian leaders? What, make, what made them come to power in a democratic environment, including the one of the European Union? But having said that, I think the uh, crisis is always uh, an opportunity for the state. Um, and we can say, I think safely, that worldwide the nation state is, is back. And we see that the state is interfering in daily lives to an extent which would have been unacceptable only a few months ago because the crisis situation uh, lends itself uh, to, to such a behavior and also socially uh, there's an inclination of, of uh, a large part of the population to, to accept because they feel the threat, the fear factor, which then is, is, is exploited. Um, in addition to that, we were all used for quite some time to the liberal international order, to effective multilateralism, uh, the effective or hopefully effective responses of international organizations, uh, United Nations, WHO, they are losing ground. So there we are see a weakening of the international environment which feeds back negatively also uh, on, on regional uh, cooperation. Um, what we also see, I think, within societies, uh, but also internationally, um, a larger uh, wedge between the rich and the poor. Um, that, that is a strain in each and every society. Um, if you have homeworking, teleworking, and you have a nice villa where you can spread out, it might not be pleasant, but it is possible. If you have a three rooms apartment and six people, 
mother, father, and children working at home, you are up for troubles. And I think internationally, it is the same if I look to Afri threats to Africa, if I look to some threats of, uh, um, of Asian uh, de developing uh, countries. And then we also say, see a certain breakdown of the of, uh, uh, international uh, production chains because of, of, of closing down of transportation links. So all that makes an environment which facilitates authoritarian and populist leaders because they always come up with simple solutions which sound convincing but at the end of the day are no solutions. Now in the European Union I think we are aware and we are growing more and more aware of it uh, because we have to admit we were also surprised by the onslaught of the pandemic we were not prepared because it was not in the in the in, in, in the guidebook or in the rule book but after some time we go back to our value-based system and you also see the European Commission as the guardian of the treaty looking and what is going on in various member states that should be done in a neutral way but it has has become very clear uh, that, that that there is um, a need to be very watchful and the president of the european commission has come out uh, with such a statement that if measures are not taken in in a proportional and time limited manner then there will be an intervention and on the international scene we ha you have heard recently the high representatives say, well, uh, I have to admit with China, we have been a little bit naive and we will correct that. So whatever the, your level you take, the national level, the regional level and the international level, um, we are in a difficult environment, but at least on the European side with the growing um, uh, understanding that it is absolutely needed uh, to go back uh, to a value-based system because we are getting a little bit lonely in that respect. <laughs> um, so I can already tell from the very interesting things that uh, both of you have had to say that we clearly have more than a half an hour to 45 minutes of things to talk about. So I'm sorry, we're probably not going to be able to get to everything that, that I would like to bring up that's stemming from your comments. Um, and I would like to come back to the question of Europe. You know, my home department here at my university is actually the EU studies department. Uh, and so obviously, you know, like many others, I'm looking at what has happened in Europe with a, a great deal of concern um, for, you know, the, the potential loss of something which, which I love. Um, you know, the, the, the European Union has been so important as this, you know, gigantic experiment in uh, you know, transnational uh, democracy, and it's uh, it's worrisome to see some of the things that are happening there. So I hope we'll get a chance, perhaps, to come back and, and touch on that again. Um, but you obviously, uh, Ambassador, you know, mentioned a very uh, interesting word here that I think might help sort of naturally lead to Professor Monk um, uh, latching onto this conversation. That's you use the word populism, uh, and uh, I believe also we've heard the word nationalism at some point come up here. Uh, Professor Monk literally wrote the book uh, on uh, threats to democracy, erosion and corrosion of democracy, partially stemming through issues such as nationalism and populism. So I'm not boxing you into talking about that, Professor Monk in particular. I'm using it more as a bridge to, 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 to get to your comments. But uh, you know, anything you want to add to the question that I asked, and then obviously anything if you want to ping off of um, Professor Greitens or uh, the ambassador. Yeah, so I'll uh, you know I, I, I'll leave out dictatorships. I think we've 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 ha heard a lot of interesting insights about those, and obviously there are many dictatorships around the world that are trying to use this moment in order to extend their power, both in terms of its intensity and in terms of its geographical scope, and that's something to worry about. Um, uh, but to me, the most worrying and in some ways intellectual most interesting thing for the last four or five years has been the way in which uh, countries that we fought were consolidated democracies, in which we didn't have to worry about the stability of a democratic system are uh, really coming under attack from this new crop of overtown populists. And, um, you know, we have seen a number of them exploit this crisis with great uh, skill and competence in order to consolidate the rule over the country. The ambassador has uh, diplomatically, uh, but as I take it quite clearly, 
uh, uh, implied that this is the case in some member states of the European Union. I would say that it's very clearly the case uh, in Hungary. Uh, Viktor Orban has um, uh, suspended parliament for an indefinite period of time. Uh, he essentially rules by decree at this point. Um, and he uh, has now made it uh, illegal to uh, spread, quote unquote, false rumors on the internet. And when one uh, user of Facebook in the country called him a dictator for that, uh, the police showed up at his door two weeks later, which uh, uh, in social sciences we call QED. Um, uh, and this, by the way, is not just a challenge to Hungary, as well as other countries where we see similar developments like the Philippines and many different countries around the world. It's a fundamental challenge to the legitimacy of the European Union. Um, I'm very lucky to be a US citizen as of a few years ago. I'm also still a German citizen. And as a German citizen, I can understand why I should share my sovereignty with uh, France or Italy. I have increasingly trouble understanding why I should share my sovereignty with a dictator in Budapest, because that's what Viktor Orban today quite clearly is. And there's rising dictators in Warsaw and other countries uh, around the European Union. That's a fundamental attack on the very nature of the EU. So I think there's a big danger that populists will exploit this moment in order to consolidate the rule uh, in countries where they're already pretty firmly in the saddle. I also think there is a way in which this crisis naturally validates their point of view. If somebody had asked me three or four months ago to come up with some huge global crisis, that better seems to validate the, the far-right populist narrative about the world than COVID-19. The idea that we should close down borders, that the world is very dangerous, that uh, people from the outside come and infect us and we might die. I mean, um, you know, this really lends itself very easily to that kind of far-right propagandizing. Um, and, and I think even in countries where populists are not yet in power, they may be able to seize upon that in order to gain in the next years. Now, the optimistic uh, development, and I think both these developments are going on at the same time, and it's too early to tell which of them is ultimately going to be stronger. But the optimistic development is that an astounding number of populists have been caught with their pants down. Uh, you know, Donald Trump, Jair Bolsonaro, uh, Narendra Modi. I mean, these uh, populists claimed that they would be able to protect the people better than anybody else, that they would have a more competent reaction than anybody else, that, you know, those normal liberals and moderates and so on, they're not capable of getting the job done. They don't care about protecting you. If you vote for me, I'm going to save you. Well, it turns out that some of the democracies that are underperforming most shockingly uh, in the United States, uh, Memorial Today, uh, right now, as we're recording this, yesterday, we crossed the threshold of 100,000 dead from COVID-19. And it still doesn't look as though the federal government has any kind of coherent response to this pandemic. So I think that is going to weaken populists who are already in power and who are failing to respond in that kind of way uh, quite significantly. And so I think you can be a little bit optimistic that some of these populists will, in fact, lose office. Uh, in the coming months and years. And I don't know which of these two uh, developments is ultimately going to prove uh, the, the more fundamental, the stronger one. Great, thanks a lot. You know, when you first mentioned that, uh, you know, populists, you know, were, were exploiting the, the virus pandemic as a, <laughs> in a way that de demonstrated skill and competence. Indeed, the first thing that ran through my head is, you know, those leaders are undermining you know, freedoms in their own countries, which of course not democratic precisely because they're already authoritarian. But you know, we see a number of populist leaders, you know, responding with great incompetence uh, and indeed, you know, undermining democracy and freedom uh, in their own countries precisely through their own incompetence. So um, I think you, you make an interesting point there. Um, so I'll switch over um, to uh, an adjacent topic, I think, which um, well, let me, yeah. Let me just add, 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 add one 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 sure. thought um, because I think if we see if we look at the development internationally, uh, then we see that those governments or, or, or leaders who uh, exercised good communication, we, who were transparent, they had they get much better results. I mean, I'm talking now from, from, from Korea, and I think what the transparency was, in, was, was crucial. And you see that also in Europe, that those governments which communicated well with its people got better results 
and and um, did not have to go down this authoritarian way. Um, in the European Union, Slovakia organized elections on a small scale compared to Korea. Korea organized uh, elections for a, a population of 51 million. So I think there were clear indications that it is not necessary to stop political or democratic life because of uh, threat and fear. And I think that we should uh, factor in into policy making. You increase resilience of democracy, you, you, you can build a bulwark against uh, authoritarianism if you are open, if you communicate, if you are transparent. Okay, well, I had an original question I was going to move on to, but instead I'm just going to pick up with, with what you said, and I'm going to throw this um, to, to Professor Greitens, I think, to start with. Um, you know, how much of a hit are we seeing to democracy, uh, you know, and to, to democratic countries and to, you know, Republican countries, uh, small r Republican countries, um, in terms of the, the soft power aspect of their response versus those of authoritarian states. You know, who's winning the soft power war? You know, you know Ambassador Reiter mentioned uh, South Korea, um, and we could also talk about Taiwan, which has been relatively successful. We could talk about a few other countries as well. New Zealand gets fairly good press for this as well. Uh, and then, you know, we can, on the other hand, you know, talk about what China is doing or what, you know, Vietnam has done. Uh, which are, of course, um, two countries that have come from this from a very different direction. You know, how should we understand the the balance and the soft power competition, let's say, between authoritarian and democratic states in responding to the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, so so I think first of all, um, we should probably avoid the tendency to see case counts uh, as the only measure of success, right? Because this is something that's going to be with us for a while. Um, that's really, really fundamentally important. Um, but this is a really complex public policy problem. And what I see is actually a huge amount of variation, which even the examples thrown out so far have, um, have demonstrated in how democracies have performed in addressing um, the challenge posed to them and to the health of their citizens by the, the pandemic. Um, and so, um, you know, as we think about what the pandemic means for the performance and the reputation and the health of democracy. Um, you know, I, I do agree that it's a threat. I, I see the threat as probably more one that comes from the kind of, of populist um, incumbent takeover of, of the executive office that, um, that Yasha um, and, and the ambassador both, both mentioned. Um, and so it's, that's a serious threat. Um, but I work a lot on, on the politics of surveillance. And one of the things that I think is very interesting is that there, I think there's a real challenge to democracies, but the idea that surveillance will fundamentally undermine democracy uniformly worldwide is, to me, not a foregone conclusion. Um, it's going to take work. It's going to take creative policy thinking. But we have a couple of models of democracies that have you know, used surveillance, yes, in unprecedented ways to deal with an unprecedented challenge, but they've also been able to exercise a great deal of democratic self-control, right? And, and so, you know, if um, for the, the two of you who are based in Korea, Korea has limits on how long data can be retained, what it can be used for, who can access it. Um, so it provides a good model. Um, the other one is Taiwan. Right. And what's interesting is that these are two countries that have, um, you know, leaders who've experienced an authoritarian period where surveillance was misused for non-democratic purposes and for repression actively. Um, both Korea and Taiwan have thought about and, and have leaders who are well aware of that risk. In both cases, we have um, people from the pro-democratic opposition sort of side of politics who occupy the, the presidential office. Um, and so, for example, in, you know, in Taiwan, um, personal data gets deleted. Um, the entire system will supposedly be erased. There's an audit procedure that's been outlined. Um, and even the use of emergency orders, right? There have been emergency orders used in Taiwan, but we're less concerned about them in part because um, there's a Commun Communicable Disease Control Act 
that was vetted already by the Constitutional Court. Um, the, the court has also ruled on when and how emergency orders can be used. And for example, they have to be proportional and they have to get legislative approval within 10 days, either ex ante or 10 days ex post. Um, and where President Tsai has gotten you know, pushback or pressure to use emergency orders or craft new legislation, she, she said very clearly, no, we're gonna try to do this within the existing legal framework. Um, so you see this really interesting uh, um, exercise in democratic self-control, which I think we need to be talking more about, right? As much as we talk about the threats, let's also offer a compelling alternative. And I think that, you know, Taiwan and South Korea aren't going to be replicable in a place like the United States. I don't know what to what extent they'd be replicable in the EU. Um, but let's at least start talking about what some successful democratic models have looked like and see what tools then we could, we might be able to use in a place in some of the democracies where this is, you know, still going to be an ongoing issue for some time. Great. That, that's, that's a super interesting point. Just one thing, if I can just jump in, you know, with you know, yeah. the experience I've had in South Korea, I think, you know, when we, when we consider how South Korea has reacted and, and the way that it's done so relatively well and, and both on the democratic side of things and on the, the technical competence side of things and on the legal side of things, there is an interesting parallel with Taiwan in that both of them did come from previously authoritarian systems and both of them had the experience of SARS in 2003 and in the case of South Korea, MERS in 2015. And when the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome um, was, was hitting in 2015, that was when South Korea uh, ratified a number of pieces of legislation uh, about uh, the government's uh, access to telecommunications data, credit card data, and things like that in order to carry out the contact tracing. Um, and obviously, you know, those are two factors, you know, historical experiences, one positive, well, I guess both of them actually negative, but you know, they have led to something positive. Um, uh, Professor Monk, it seemed like you wanted to jump in and say something. Yeah, it, it seems to me like these last two uh, contributions are really quite connected, which is to say that for defenders of democracy, it's tempting to oppose any form of extended state power and to say, you know, there's this pandemic, a lot of governments are going to try to use this in order to uh, gain powers that are very dangerous to democracy. And so our blanket policy should just be to be against that. Um, and there's certainly some context where there's good reason to be very skeptical about the good intentions of a government. Um, but I think that there will nevertheless be a mistake. Um, and so in my mind, uh, any action that countries and democracies uh, particularly take against COVID-19 need to fulfill three simple criteria. The first is that they have to be temporary. They have to be temporary in a way uh, where there is a clear sunset clause. So they lapse at a natural moment. And then of course they can be extended if the need arises. But that leads to the second point, which is that it has to be under some form of democratic and where appropriate judicial control. So that it's not uh, a prime minister uh, simply ruling by decree, it's a parliament deciding to uh, extend those rules. And the third, which is very important, is that the measures have to be strictly necessary, strictly tailored towards actually saving lives and actually combating the disease. It can't be um, a moment for the government to do all kinds of other things it would like to do uh, in any case. Now, what's important is to, is, is, is to find that balance. Because if democracies don't do that and they end up systematically performing worse than other political regime forms, this is going to be very dangerous to democracy in the long run as well. Because people will then rightly look around the world and say, look, if democracies can't protect us against something like COVID-19, but autocracies can, um, then what's the point of democracy? I mean, why should we care about all of these values if literally those values also mean that we're more likely to die? So I think making sure that democracies are able to deal with this disease while sticking to their principles um, is very, very important. I think it is possible, as some of those countries uh, suggest. Now, the link to soft power is both that in the long run, the soft power of democracies will depend on its ability to deal with this terrible pandemic, at least as well as other kinds of regime forms and hopefully better. Uh, but it's also that it uh, doesn't come down, I'm afraid, to South Korea. It doesn't come down to Taiwan. It doesn't even come down to Germany. It comes down to the United States and to China. Those are the two major players and those are the two countries 
whose soft power really is going to matter. And I think the pandemic in that sense has a very, very clear impact on one end of the equation and, and an unclear impact on the other end of the equation. Well, the soft power then, of the United States is, is, no, no, sorry, is, sorry, go ahead. The soft power of the United States has been seriously harmed by this. Uh, I mean, the inability of the United States to have a coordinated federal response to this pandemic. The fact that, uh, you know, all of the uh, uh, machinery of government and all of the wealth of the United States has not enabled the country to have a response that is on the height of South Korea or China, of, 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 of Germany or some other autocratic countries in the world, is going to lastingly harm America's reputation in the world. Um, now, on the other end of the equation, when you compare the most salient democracy to the most salient autocracy, I think the story in China has been mixed and complicated, and it's probably too early to tell exactly whether the world will ultimately be impressed by China's relative ability to contain the disease within the country so far, um, uh, or whether it will blame China for the fact that it didn't manage to contain the disease to such an extent that it didn't go around the world. Um, but, but I think the main way in which it's a mixed story is that China is going to start to experience some of the treatment that the United States has been used to for the last 60 or 70 years. Which say that if you are one of the really preeminent players in the system, there's some people who probably give you too much of a pass on certain things because they're impressed by you and they think that there's a lot to admire and they love you in certain ways. And there's also a lot of people who hate you, sometimes because the country really does wrong things and often in ways that are unfair and irrational. And I think in the mind of a world, it's not clear whether China has acted positively or negatively in this pandemic. But what's very clear is that it's now arrived as a major player on the world scene. And I think it's going to start having more soft power, having more influence in the world, but also start to attract a lot more of the scrutiny and a lot more of the sometimes justified, sometimes unjustified uh, hatred that comes with being a major player in the world system. I'm just going to jump in there. I mean, Professor Munk has now brought up the, you know, 800 pound panda in the room. So I guess we might as well, um, might as well get to it. Um, and, and in fact, I, I guess I'll you know, just briefly say, I mean, my, my reading of, of China's wolf warrior response to this so far, you know, hasn't been that the country has responded to criticism with a tremendous amount of equanimity. And we'll see like how much they're able to evolve in terms of their you know, diplomatic um, perspective and their, their diplomatic outlet going forward. Perhaps that will be a question for Professor Greitens in just a moment. For the, for the moment, I'm going to turn to Professor, uh, to Ambassador and Professor uh, Greitens and uh, sort of pick up with uh, where Professor Monk left off. You know, you know, as an EU ambassador here, uh, you know, obviously you're well attuned to both, uh, you know, how East Asia and notably South Korea looks at China, but also with how the European Union looks at China, both uh, on the merits on its own and also uh, in comparison with the United States. Uh, how do you think, for instance, uh, the European Union is weighing the relative performance of the U.S. and China? Well, I mean, for the, for the European Union, like for the two other partners you have mentioned, there's the necessity that we have a relationship, and preferably a good relationship in the triangle. I also underline triangle because I, I'm, for obvious reasons, no fan of, uh, of a dualistic uh, approach, of a G2 approach or what, what, uh, whatever. Um, I think we, from the European side, uh, we have already set the direction uh, two years ago with the new China policy, where we have said very clearly that in some areas uh, China is a partner, in some areas, it is a competitor, and in other areas, it is a systemic rival. And uh, you, we have to define now policies which take into account these three elements, and that will have will lead to functional cooperation in different areas to a different degree and intensity. But it, at the same time, it will be necessary to 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 show very clearly where the borders are. And I think experience shows us that, uh, that, that China uh, is accepting clear language um, and, 
as uh, my boss uh, likes to say, uh, Europe has to learn uh, to the language of power. I think we still have uh, uh, some miles to go. Uh, however, um, recognizing the need, recognizing the fact to start the journey, I think is, is, is already an important uh, uh, step. Uh, and I think we, could, we, we saw it also very, very clearly at the beginning. I think in January, uh, we had the impression there is a serious health problem in, in China and the European Union was sending uh, uh, equipment to China. Uh, we had to learn then very quickly that it was not like in the past, oh, the Asians or the Africans, they have a problem, but it turned out to be a global problem, a pandemic, uh, therefore a pandemic. And I think there, is, there lies the strength of the European Union in coming out with the need for effective multilateralism. Uh, there is an area where perhaps we don't see eye to eye with the Chinese because they also talk about multilateralism, but it is a unilateral multilateralism. So if you use the same word, um, uh, you might have a completely different thinking uh, be behind it. And on the, on, on, on the other side of the transatlantic, I, I see a little bit too much zero-sum thinking. And I think that, that makes cooperation uh, more difficult, but doesn't exclude it. Um, we are discovering and we are pushing within the European Union solidarity, not without problems. Um, and the equivalent is multilateral cooperation on the international scene. Uh, so a confrontational triangle would, would be a lose, lose, lose situation, I think, which all have an interest to, to, to avoid. And it does, does also not have help if one is ganging up with the other against the other one. Um, and therefore, we have to return as quickly as possible to this uh, international governance system with the United Nations at, at its core in order to come back uh, to this rule-based approach. And I say come back because we have to come back within the European Union. We have given up temporarily, and I think that's the, that's the important element, uh, the freedom of traveling. I mean, that was one of the uh, major achievements of the European Union. And I think as many Europeans would like to get rid of these limitations as quickly as possible, because this is something which has become part of, of our genes. And I just take that as one example uh, uh, and uh, will not go in, 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 in other ones. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I, you know, as someone who's you know, lived in Europe for a while, uh, you know, myself and you know, I have family there, uh, yeah, the the restrictions on the you know Schengen area, uh, you know, borderless, you know, frictionless travel uh, is is really a problem. And it, you know, just to put this in a longer term context, obviously, you know, you know, we've seen with the terrorist attacks there that we've seen increasing invocations of the right of the EU member states to invoke their uh, extraordinary uh, measures to close the borders down. Then we've seen it with the immigration flows that have come in from the Middle East and North Africa, and now we're seeing it again with the pandemic. And you know, it seems like that's one cherry on on one sour tasting cherry on top of an already problematic cake. And you know, it's going to take take I think quite some political courage to roll back uh, some of those restrictions. Unfortunately, that's just an aside. Yeah, I want to turn on to Professor. Just, just, think one, one, just one sentence. I think the, the important distinction is that in Europe we have these limitations in for health protection reasons and not for any political reasons to limit the freedom of speech, the freedom of expression, the freedoms of, of assembly. And I think that makes the big difference from authoritarianism which we have discussed. It is a health protection uh, measure and I'm absolutely confident that the European system makes sure that this is not turned into a political one. Even if the temptation in some countries might go into this direction, I think the European governance system will put limits and will keep everybody within the family, but sometimes there are tensions within families. If I may, Ambassador, what has the EU done in the last 10 years to ensure that in Hungary and why on earth should we be sanguine about your ability 
uh, to make sure that there is real freedom of speech in Hungary, which there wasn't before COVID-19, and it seems to me it's very unlikely to be after COVID-19. Well, uh, I think we, we, we had uh, very clear st statements uh, recently from the, from, from, from the President of the European uh, Commission that this is under very strict sur surveillance and if there is proof that the uh, fundamental rights are not respected, the Commission will, will intervene. You have very clear uh, declarations from the European Parliament which passes resolution and which watches very carefully. You have, you have actions and warnings from the European People's Party uh, where, uh, Hungar where the Hungarian leadership is, 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 uh, is part, but is, there's a suspension uh, right now. So you see it very clearly. It is on the, on the, um, on the watch list. And uh, I think the indications are that this um, uh, limitless uh, uh, um, legislation will be changed rather, rather soon. So the European way is, and this is also part because we, are, we have to go through uh, administrative and legislative democratic processes, it takes, it takes some time. Um, and it, it's not only one country, there are also other countries where uh, you have seen actions by the European Commission uh, which also sees the, the, the European Court of Justice. So I have confidence in the system. I understand the frustration that uh, some people would say, well, one has to act quicker, but we can only act within our own legal system. And the only legal system is a system which was agreed uh, by the 27 member states. So this is a legal corset, but I would always argue against um, any attempts to say, well, you have to take undemocratic measures to, to fight um, non-democratic behavior. I think that would be a disservice to democracy. So I'm conscious that this, we're two Europeans and I don't want to hijack a conversation for the Asia society in the direction of Europe, but I do just want to register my strong skepticism about the prospects of that. There have been many statements from the European Commission all along about the evident abuses of democracy in Hungary, and they never had any impact. It is incredible, I mean, mind-boggling, that the biggest faction of the European Parliament, which includes, for example, the CDU, uh, the mm -hmm. party of Angela Merkel, still has as a member, albeit formally in some kind of pro forma way uh, suspended, uh, the ruling party of a dictator in Hungary. And uh, as you're saying, the institutions of the European Union are built in such a way that it is essentially impossible to take uh, strong sanctions against a member state in any way that is not uh, unanimous among the member states other than that particular country. And since we at this point uh, have uh, uh, deeply anti-democratic governments that the EU has allowed to uh, form and, 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 and take place without punishment at a time when that might still have been possible within the rule work of the European Union in more than one country, in fact, probably even more than two countries, the prospect for being able to actually sanction Hungary um, is very, very small. And the idea that Viktor Orban, who has uh, danced smilingly around some of your weak statements for the last 10 years, will suddenly reverse course because of yet another statement, uh, I think is frankly uh, naive. Okay, then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll table that and we can do this again. Um, I'm sure that the Asia Society would be happy to have you back uh, in the future and we can do this again and we can talk about uh, Europe uh, in, in a context that would be relevant uh, to the Asia Society's interests. I want to come back briefly to China where we, like I said, we could have gone on for hours, I think, but we're already pushing our time as it is. So I want to come back uh, briefly uh, to China and, and I want to get um, Professor Greitens um, to weigh in on you know, what I think is something that has uh, clearly concerned uh, people, you know, all over the democratic world over the last uh, week or so, and that's uh, China's um, rhetoric vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, and then the most recent statement and uh, imposition of this national security law uh, in Hong Kong. What does this portend? 
Yeah. So let me let me start for just a moment by talking a little bit about um, and closing the circle on something that was raised earlier about the U.S.-China relationship that, that Professor Monk talked about. Um, I think what we're seeing in U.S.-China yeah. relations, and, and this relates to the question of Hong Kong, so I, I'll, I'll explain the connection in just a moment, um, is sort of a perfect storm of, of a number of different factors. On the U.S. side, we have an administration that came in saying from the beginning that it was going to take a tougher line and rewrite some of the assumptions of U.S.-China relations. Um, we also have the sort of cyclical uptick in tough on China rhetoric that we typically see in the U.S. in a campaign year. Um, so that's domestic politics on the U.S. side. On the Chinese side, we have a leader in Xi Jinping who clearly is breaking the mold of some of his predecessors and returning to a much more centralized, much more sort of single leader, charismatic um, type of, autoc of autocracy. Um, and so you take those, those domestic changes in the US and China, and you layer on a pandemic, which I think is sort of tailor-made to lay bare one of the fundamental problematic or sort of perennial problems of Chinese governance, which is the lack of transparency in the system. Um, and that just creates a tremendous amount of, of stress. Um, and so what you actually see right now is the U.S. and China each talking about transparency and each trying to put out their narrative, but they're actually talking past each other because um, when China talks about transparency, it's talking about local officials not being transparent with higher level officials. So it's a lack of internal transparency um, and they talk about things they've done to address that problem. Um, but when the United States talks about it, they're talking partly about China's transparency with the outside world and whether or not China provided adequate information to the WHO, to the United States, to the, the international community. But they're also saying, look, like your lack of internal transparency now fundamentally has a global impact, right? And so whichever sort of blend of transparency problems you think occurred here, which we could debate probably for another hour. Um, regardless, it, that, that feature of China's political system is now having a, a global impact. And so as that aspect of China's system has come under sort of inner, more international critical scrutiny, China has done things like the mask diplomacy. Um, and you've also seen this sort of wolfware type diplomacy um, I don't love that term, but the sort of more aggressive di diplomacy globally defending and promoting what China has done. The problem with that, um, and this is where Hong Kong comes in, is that, so, you know, sort of, I, I talked very specifically about the, the bilateral dynamic between the US and China. Um, and so it was easier for the rest of the world to kind of write that off as the Trump administration and Xi Jinping, and this is a feature of, of sort of this one, albeit tremendously important, complex bilateral relationship. But if China's, you know, sort of more aggressive diplomacy in the U.S.-China sphere is being paired with militarization in the South China Sea, which has been, isn't just a feature of the pandemic, but has occurred since 2015, um, what we're seeing in Hong Kong, and now potentially a third, you know, area of crisis on the Indian border, on the border with India, um, then all of a sudden the sort of assertive or more aggressive diplomatic posture being taken um, in U.S.-China relations is much less about the U.S. or the U.S.-China relationship, much more about the way that China is now engaging with the world. And it's less about U.S.-China relations than it is about China's entire sort of approach to foreign policy and diplomacy. Um, and so I think that that could create a real risk of overreach that could backfire on China pretty quickly. Um, and we just don't know exactly how that's going to play out, right? How, how much um, China's own behavior is going to foster this perception of, of overreach and pushing and, and create pushback in the international community. But I think how we view China's performance in the pandemic and how we view China's role in the world are related. And so it's not just that the pandemic will affect perceptions of the Chinese diplomacy, but all these other areas where China is now engaged in, in crisis or looks like it's, it's engaging in strategic opportunism 
to expand its power um, are also going to reflect back on perceptions of what it means to have a world partially led by China. Um, and so that's that soft power point that Dr. Monk was talking about. Super. We have we have already honestly gone over time. And I've, let me first of all thank each of the three of you for uh, taking taking the time even more than I told you that you would have to spend here. Um, I also think it's been a tremendously edifying conversation. Usually at the end, uh, I have a similar problem where I, I'm running up against the time limit. And so my tactic for getting the last few questions is, is I have a sort of lightning round where I ask everything is a yes, no question, but I don't even think I have time for that, um, unfortunately. Um, so instead, I'm just going to ask uh, you know, each of you to give a sort of you know, one last brief closing statement, you know, the, the last small paragraph that you would like to tell the world about how we should think about the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic and uh, democracy and republicanism worldwide. Let's start with uh, Professor Monk. Well, I think the key point is that, um, you know, COVID-19 is one of the biggest crises we faced in a very, very long time. And how democracies deal with it is going to determine the reputation for a very, very long time. And so I think it's the responsibility of all of us as, as citizens and as uh, people who have some amount of political influence uh, to try and help uh, our governments and our countries uh, save lives. Um, uh, and and beat back this pandemic. Um, that's the most important thing to do if you care about the horrible suffering um, that we have in countries like the United States today. But it's also the most important thing if you care about the basic values of democracy thriving in the 21st century. Great, thank you. Ambassador Ryder, closing statement. Well, I, I'm, I remain the optimist uh, who thinks that the Democrat, that, that democracy will, will prevail uh, because we will see at the end of the day the resilience of democratic societies is bigger than, than others. Uh, that's the point which I made on transparency, communication and openness is, is, is the essential one. Uh, we have, but we have to actively see that we don't lose out to the spinning of narratives. I think this is our obligations. And at the same time, if we, held, if we are able to holding up the values and principles and the human rights for which we stand and the, sol and the, and the solidarity, which we don't only preach, but also actually implement, I think that will help us. And I'm confident that we can, that, that we can achieve that. And as a foreign policy uh, uh, guy, I must say, uh, European Union is probably one of the, the, the only uh, uh, institution which has come up with a substantial program which we call Team Europe, which is completely destined for partner countries. So we are not only thinking about ourselves, but also internationally. And I think that fits into the frame uh, which, which we have. However, we have to fight. That's, for, that's, that's clear. Great, thank you. Professor Gardens, you get the last word. Okay. I, democracy requires maintenance and vigilance to protect against backsliding. And I agree that COVID-19 poses some real threats, the threat of populism, the threat of encroachment of surveillance and uh, erosion of civil liberties. Um, and so we need to really be active in thinking carefully now about what measures we're willing to adopt and what the limits on state power uh, we want to be so that we can deal with the pandemic in a way that is both capable, protects the ends for which democracy is created, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, to, to go back to the American declaration. Um, but, but also, um, you know, that protects the institutions of democracy and, and civil liberties, right? So we, we need, um, those two should be seen as compatible, not as a zero sum trade-off. Um, and that's, as Professor Monk said, that's the responsibility of, of all of us. Um, and so we, you know, we, we are facing a, a serious threat, um, but I think the best thing that we can do is to come up with a compelling way to deal with the challenge that is compatible with our values and our interests. 
Great, thank you so much. I really appreciate all three of you. Uh, from, for the Asia Society, I would like to thank um, our guests, uh, Professor Yasha Munk, uh, Professor Sheena Greitens, and, and Ambassador Michelle Reiter uh, for their contributions today. And we hope that you will join us again in the future. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>